now we're going to move to Serbia. I know we haven't really been in Bosnia Herzegovina all, all that long, but here we are, and here's a map to show us where we where we're going. We are here in Sarajevo. We are going to Belgrade, the capital, and then we will spend uh, a lovely day up here in Bovedina at the capital Novi Sad, which is quite beautiful and very old. Okay, let's move on. So, okay, Novi Sad, this is the main square, and this is the administrative capital of Novi Sad, and directly opposite that capital is the Catholic Cathedral. The Catholic Cathedral was donated to the city uh, by the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. They said they would pay for the cathedral, but it had to be in the main square. It was a little unfortunate that probably only 20% of the population were Catholic. And the Orthodox Cathedral which was far more important to them, it had to go into a minor square. But again, stunningly beautiful buildings. Um, Novi Sad was settled before 5000 BC, so it is very old. It's a city of great charm and elegance. The border with Hungary meant that for much of the 18th and 19th century, Novi Sad was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It's composed of a series of squares. NATO bombing in 1990 left the city with no bridges over the Danube and it is built on the Danube, which you'll find almost everything in Serbia is built on the Danube. Some more of the charming buildings, a different square this time. And there are also many modern buildings. They have a, 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 a stunning building, which I'm sorry I can't show you, of uh, dramatic art. Uh, but compared to many other places in Serbia, this has absolutely stunning buildings. And there is Novi Sad on the Danube River. And that was one of the bridges that was blown away by the NATO bombing. Again, an Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Churches seem to be in very, very much better condition than the Catholic Churches. So I do think that the people see their religion as being important. Even though, of course, they were uh, in a communist regime, it wasn't a communist regime that said you can no longer have religion. In Belgrade, perhaps the thing that stuck out more for me than anything else was Kalamagdan, which is a park in the centre of the city, which takes up about 40% of the city. It's absolutely huge. It's one of the best parks I've ever visited. Stunning, and it's set high above where the Sava and Danube rivers meet. It has art galleries, military museums, weddings with brass bands, dancing, and a dinosaur park. What more can one want? Okay. Dinosaur park, and I'm very sorry, we don't have any sound effects. They were terrifying, the sound effects.
as everywhere you can always buy souvenirs. And there is the brass band. All weddings are accompanied by a brass band. Uh, is an example of uh, a typical Yugoslav era building as there are plenty of modern and new ones around as you can see next door but that was very much the style in which things were built on the outskirts of Belgrade we have the um, Tito's Mausoleum, Museum and Gardens. They're, I suppose, about 10 kilometres outside of the city, but quite beautiful. And the museum has an amazing collection of things that were given to Tito. Uh, apart from anything else, at his funeral was attended by no fewer than 96 uh, prime Ministers, Kings, Queens, Princes, which was pretty amazing. He, he had a very wide-ranging influence and probably, while Tito can be said to have done some pretty awful things too, he also managed to give the people of Yugoslavia for the first time an opportunity to know that they had a job for life, that they had accommodation, that, uh, that they were able, towards the end of the period, to buy out very cheaply. And it, uh, he certainly made a big difference to their lives. I know my guide in Novi Sad uh, said that she, the only reason she, her husband and child, had a home to live in was that her parents had been able to buy their unit. And when her father had died, her mother had bought a, a, a little country cottage that she had moved to and had left the apartment to her daughter, husband and son. She also pointed out to me that things were so difficult in Serbia that um, for her, a, a really great and enjoyable thing was to have enough money to be able to buy a cup of coffee. These are the gardens around the museum. And that is Tito's uh, China dinner service that was um, uh, part of the museum. Now, here, we're here in Belgrade, but we are going down here very close to the border uh, with Bosnia uh, to the next place that we're going to visit. It's called Mokragora and it was a little village that was built to shoot a film in and now it's used as accommodation for the Sagan 8 railway which at the time was Serbia's pride and joy because it, it, they'd worked out how they could get a train up and over the mountains by constantly lapping round and steadily getting higher all the time. And it meant that it was possible to catch a train and to work over the border. As you can, this is the village again and where we were staying. And at every stop, there were vantage points when you got out of the train where you could see all the countryside around there. It was quite a, quite a, an experience, the train. 
infinitely better than Puffing Bill. Now we're going across to um, a university town called Nis down near the border. Historically, it's very interesting and had it, uh, it's part of the area that had been taken over by the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and perhaps uh, this story might give you some idea of how the Ottomans operated. The Skull Tower. Right, when a number of local people rebelled against the uh, Ottoman Empire uh, person in charge, uh, they were put down most forcefully. And uh, I think it is a I think there was 186 skulls put into the four walls of the tower. Now this is part of a church. <laughs> 